Good morning, Radiant Church. Happy anniversary, everybody. We're excited for week number two of this brand new fall series entitled The Battle. So before we get started this morning, though, I want to introduce someone to you, someone that's very important to us. Uh, You've heard me tell many stories over the years about growing up in an incredible uh, setting of revival, a youth ministry. And uh, my youth pastor, his name is Jeff Gurnell, is with us this morning. Uh, He was my youth pastor growing up, and he's still involved and invested in youth ministry globally around the nation. He's here this weekend investing into our youth ministries at both Portage and here at Richland Consulting, and uh, I wanted to introduce him to you. So would you guys welcome Jeff Grinnell. Come on up, Jeff. (laughs) Say a few words. I... uh, I don't call him Jeff, I call him PJ for Pastor Jeff. So go ahead and say hello to everybody. P. Lee, that's right. We would do some stand up here, but he's got a message to get to. (laughs) And he told me uh, two minutes, so. One, Um, but you can have two. Yeah, like three ish. (laughs) So I love this house. I so love this house. Uh, The family, Jane and the kids, and the rest of you too. I don't know you, but I gotta love you, you gotta love me, and you know, so. Hey, I'm here uh, because I'm working with the student ministry department, the next gen, over the course of the next year. And if we don't do something about student ministry in the church in America, and the Lord tarries 25 years, that is a crisis for the church. Because we don't have a lot of emphasis across the nation on student ministry. I want you to know, I have the advantage point of being in a different setting every week, small, medium, large churches, uh, denominational, non-denominational settings, in the urban, the rural, the suburban setting. I get to see it. It's kind of a disadvantage advantage, okay? But I'm telling you, with even with the kind of emphases that you see here, you model worship, you model the strength of the word, the setting here is alive with awakening and revival, right? But not every setting is like that. And I'm telling you, the greatest sustainability tool or effort in the church is student ministry. I want all of the students, 19 and under, I want you to stand. If you are 19 and under, I want you to stand. (laughs) First of all, I love you. Uh, Somebody else could say that too, or clap or something maybe, you know, I I don't know, just thought of that. If you you work with them, if you work with them, stand. If you work 19 and under, stand. Will you stand too? Thank you. So, I'm just gonna say, this generation right here is the only, you can stay standing, is the only generation living in America that has not seen an awakening. We've seen the first great awakening in the mid 1700s, the second great awakening in the mid 1800s. We've seen the Azusa Street Revival at the turn of the 20th century. And then uh, right about 1967 to 77, we saw the Jesus Movement. We haven't seen a significant spiritual awakening in America since, which means that the millennial and the Gen Z, Gen Z, the teenagers who are standing now, have not seen the church healthy They don't understand 4%, Barna said, a 4% Christian worldview exists amongst Gen Z. So we have work to do. I'm here for the next 10 months to practically work that out with your youth department. But I'm gonna ask this. Over at the other campus in Portage right now too, I can see you standing, right? you're, You're there too. I'm gonna ask you this. For 30 leaders to step up, at each campus and join this discipleship to join this awakening of teenagers because this is the leadership model of the church. This is how the church, there isn't an organization here that doesn't think about sustainability. Mm -hmm. And the best way that we sustain an awakening in this area is with these people right here because these are your next deacons, your next teachers, your next elders, and your next pastors. Amen? Amen. So 
30 leaders is what I'm praying for over the next, Amen. Over the next 10 months. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. I love you. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Awesome. So we want you families to know we are 100% committed to making Radiant Church a church that is not just uh, tolerating next gen, we wanna be a church that is a pipeline for the next generation of church leaders, not just here, but around the world, amen? So you guys committed to that with us? Come on, put your hands together if you'll say yes. You'll pray for that, awesome. Turn with me in your Bibles today to Ephesians chapter six. This is week two of our fall series entitled The Battle. Everybody say this with me, say the battle. battle. Say the battle is real. Because as I said to you last week, the Christian life is not like a battle. The Christian life is a battle. And because it's a battle, we need to know not only the tactics of our enemy, the weapons of our warfare, but we need, we need to know the God of our victory and we need to know the authority that we have from him. And so today, I wanna share a message with you entitled, Positioned to Win, Positioned to Win. To win, And look with me here at Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 13. This is the New King James translation of the Bible, and it says this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all taking the shield of faith with which you would be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints." So as we can see very clearly, Paul's emphasis, his focus, is about positioning the believer so that when the enemy attacks, and the enemy will attack, when the war comes to your home, when the battle becomes a reality in your daily life, when culture becomes a combat zone, you know how to stand on that day. You know how to stand in what he calls the evil day. You have the armor of God and you are, as he says, able to withstand. And, and I love what he says, when you've done everything to stand, stand therefore. When you've done everything to stand in your own strength and in your own power, then stand in the strength that belongs to God. It's so important that you and I, it's, in fact, it's critical that you and I know how to stand in the battle, the spiritual battle that you and I are engaged in. And in order for you to know how to stand, you've gotta know the fundamentals of standing because not all standing is equal. It's interesting, the, the word that Paul uses for stand is actually a military word. It's the same word in your Bibles, the same root word in the original language that's, that means to be steadfast. It's, it's not just talking about standing. How many know you can see somebody kind of stand and it's like this? But they're not ready for battle. That's not ready for battle. You don't see soldiers on the front line, you know, just kind of like, I mean, Braveheart. You don't see <laughs> those guys all lined up there going, mm -hmm. you know, this. It's, it's a stance. It's a steadfast, readied position to not only receive the enemy, and to hold your ground, but you're positioned to attack, you're positioned to take territory, and in order for you to know how to withstand the onslaught of the enemy and to stand in the authority that God has for you, you've got to learn the fundamentals of your positioning. I grew up, like a lot of you, playing a lot of different sports, and uh, I was okay at some of them, better at others, terrible at some. But what's interesting is that when you study athletes that are elite in their field or in their sport, or even soldiers, is that long before they ever take the court, long before they ever step onto the field or the battlefield, they've practiced fundamentals. 
the fundamentals. I mean, if you've ever tried to teach your kids basketball, they're little. What's fundamental? It's learning how to dribble. Fundamental, positioning. A defensive position when you're in basketball, it's like keep your, keep your center of balance low, keep your hands out for you know, trying to steal the ball or to block there, and you, and you learn these moves, the shuffle. How many remember you know, learning these in gym class? And then there's the na, 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 dance. In football, they, you, know, you do these drills. You do layups, and you learn how to position yourself to come off a pick and to receive the pass and to take a shot. And you do those drills over and over and over again, thousands and thousands and thousands of times, so that when you get on the floor in the midst of competition, you don't have to think about it. It's second nature to you. A soldier goes into basic training and he learns maneuvers, tactics, he learns how to take commands. He knows when to advance. He knows when to retreat. He knows how to position himself low. He knows how hand-to-hand -hand combat. Why does he practice all those? Because on the day of the battle is not the day to begin to learn. If you're trying to learn how to take a jump shot on the first day of the game, you just showed up, you didn't practice, you're not, you're not developing muscle memory, you'll be defeated. It's not the time, you'll be benched is what will happen. <laughs> you know, a football player doesn't show up to figure out how to catch a ball on the day of the game. No, he's done it over and over and over, so when he shows up on game day, he knows how to catch, unless you're a Detroit Lions, and <laughs> then you just kind of show up. <laughs> Soldiers, athletes, know that what you do in secret is in preparation for what takes place in public. And Christians need to learn some lessons from that because there's a positioning that we need to learn and it doesn't come natural. There's a positioning in the spirit, a positioning that is internal that we have to learn. That's why Paul says stand, withstand in the evil day. When you've done everything to stand, stand therefore because the battle is coming. It's not a question of if it's coming, it's when it's coming. And what I've realized is that a lot of times as Christians, we love God, we are loved by God, we have a desire in our hearts to be overcomers and to be victorious in the midst of the battle, but we've not practiced the fundamentals that produce the ability to stand. And so when the enemy comes, he knocks us off balance. I used to, I used to play this game with my kids called the, uh, I think it was just, we called it the smack game, but it wasn't what you think, I promise <laughs> But my kids, when they were little, I'd stand them up in the kitchen, and my dad taught it to me. So you stand toe-to-toe, -to -toe and you put your hands at shoulder height like this, and the goal is to knock the other person off balance. Just with your hands. You just you know, smack them, or you draw them in, and the first person to take a step forward or step back loses. And so when my kids were little, you know, I have two little girls, they'd come up and, Dad, play the smack game. Okay, so here, you know, you get down with your girls, and you let them just kind of, you absorb the blow, and then you, and they fall back, and they go, Oh, Dad. And then they run along. Now, my son was a different story. My son is highly competitive, and he's like, Dad, let's play a smack game. <laughs> so when he's six years old, it's like, <clears throat> and he just fall back, do it again. So he's practicing. He's like, how do you do it? I'm like, you gotta, you gotta know when to go in, and you gotta know when to, you gotta know how to stand. You gotta balance yourself. So that's fine until he grows to six foot six. <laughs> and then one day he comes in the kitchen and says, Dad, Let's play the smack game. <laughs> Wood floors. I'm like, all right. He's like, I'm taking you down, old man. I'm like, you've never, I'm undefeated. <laughs> Let's go. So, you know, first, first time it's like, <clears throat> bam. You just get them when they're off balance. And then he falls back. He caught me. I was going in for the push. And my 230 pound, six foot six son happened to also be coming in for the push. <laughs> and his meat hooks wrapped over the top of my hands, and he shoved me across the room into the door jam, shook loose the, the drywall sheeting on the wall. <laughs> it was the first time he's ever beat me, and I could see the look in his eyes shift. He's like, I won. <laughs> it was like Rocky Forrest, like, he's human. See, he bleeds. Uh, Israel, I'm gonna take him down. Uh, yeah. Why can't we all just get along? I mean, come on. Yeah. 
I can see the look in his eye. He's fired up because he won. Listen, we got to get to a place where we get some victories under our belt so that every time the enemy comes against us, we don't just assume that our position is a place of defeat. Because unfortunately, the enemy has discipled us that our position is to surrender. Every time temptation comes, we just assume we're gonna lose. Every time the the enemy comes, we give credit to the enemy. We make the enemy bigger than we believe God is. And what Jesus wants to happen in our lives is he wants you and I to get some victories where we learn to stand in his strength and in his victory with the armor of God on that we actually step into the realm of being overcomers. But in order for us to do that, we've got to answer the question, which is, what position are you in today? What position are you in today? Are you standing in the strength and in the power of God's might? Or are you standing in the midst of your battle in your own strength? Have you learned the fundamentals of what it takes to be a victorious son or daughter of God? Are you leaning into a defensive posture where God is your source and your strength? Or are you walking around dressed in your own attire? Is it game day and you're wearing jeans? Is it the battle, but you're unprepared. As I said last week, if you go into the battle casually, you'll come out of the battle a casualty. We can't be casual about this. It is so essential that we understand that the battle is very real. Verse number 11, he says, put on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the enemy. Well, how do we put on the armor of God? How do we learn how to stand? I think we need to recognize that if you don't stand for something, you'll eventually fall for anything. And the enemy knows that and he takes advantage in our lives. And listen, when we see ourselves fall, when we see ourselves pushed back, when we see the enemy seem to get victory after victory over us, that doesn't mean that that's, that that is our destiny. That should be a wake-up call for us that there's more. That you don't have to lose the battle. Let me tell you what James says. James chapter one, you've probably heard this a hundred times, but it says in James chapter one, it says, count it all joy, brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, the battle. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness or the ability to stand. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If you would just write out in your margins, circle the word faith and out in your margins, write this word, convictions. Because when you find yourself in a battle, when trials come your way, The Bible tells us to count it all joy. Well, I don't know about you, but when I find myself in difficult circumstances or in the middle of spiritual battles or warfare, my first reaction is not to think about how exciting this is. It's not to think about how joyful I am right now. It's it's typically, it's like, why am I going through this? Fear, anxiety, stress, heaviness comes upon you, and the enemy wants to grip you with fear, but God says, no, count it all joy. How can I count it all joy? Because what God says is there's a testing that is taking place, and the testing is of your faith or your convictions. God allows us to go through some things. What the enemy meant for evil, God turns around for good. He allows He allows us to go through some things so that our faith rises to the surface and our convictions can be more clarified. Because when your convictions get stronger, when your convictions become clearer in your life, you become stronger. Because let me tell you where defeat comes. Defeat and compromise in the life of a believer comes when the convictions of the tempter are stronger than the convictions of the temptee. When the enemy's conviction about why you should be defeated are stronger than your convictions about who Jesus is and the victory that he's already won for you, that's when compromise and defeat take place. But in a testing ground, when the heat is turned up, in the day of battle, when you stand there and you cry out to God and you have to test and you have to prove 
what your convictions are, that's when the victory comes. That's when your ability to stand becomes so much stronger. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter three. Let me, let me show you something about standing this morning. We all know the story of Daniel. It's one of the most famous stories in the Bible. In fact, there's probably three or four really, really famous stories in the book of Daniel. One's Daniel in the lion's den, but the other has to do with the three other Hebrew children, young men who have been taken captive from Jerusalem. They're of royal descent, kingly descent. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian Empire have taken and sacked the entire city of God, and they've taken all the, the very noble, wealthy, and influential young leaders, and they've brought them and instead of killing them or putting them in prison cells, they've given them brand new Babylonian names. They've given them high levels of position. They've probably turned them into eunuchs. And they're standing in the king's courts because they're impressive. And the goal that the king has for these young Jewish leaders is to get them to compromise their Jewish convictions, their commitment to God. So he gives them new identities. Your name's no longer gonna be Mishael, it's gonna be this, named after one of our Babylonian gods. And one of the ways that they wanted to kind of assimilate them into culture is, we want you to eat at the king's table every single day. Well, most of what was served at the king's table was food that was not kosher, it was not acceptable under the Mosaic dietary laws. Some of it had even been sacrificed unto idols. And so in, when, by the time we get to Daniel chapter three, what we see is that the children of Israel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or Rakshak and Benny, if you grew up on Veggie Tales, <laughs> have been placed in the king's courts. They've been given new names, They've been sent to re-education camps and they're living in a Babylonian culture. So anytime we as Christians think it would be a whole lot easier to serve Jesus if I just lived in a Christian world with Christian friends, went to a Christian school, listened to Christian music, watched Christian television, read Christian books, wore Christian t-shirts, used Christian breath mints, had Christian bumper stickers, and was not contaminated by the world, then I could follow Jesus. Well, then all you need to do is go back and look at Daniel, Meshach, Abednego, and Shadrach. Because they did it in the midst of a Babylonian culture. By Daniel 3, what we find is that Nebuchadnezzar had erected this massive idol and required that everybody come, see the idol, the image, and bow down to it and worship it. And so he, he calls the entire kingdom together, the whole city together, and he says, this is the image of Nebuchadnezzar. This is your new God. So when you hear the musicians play and the horns blow and you see the commanders move into place, everybody bow down. Bow down to the image. Bow down to the God that you're going to serve. And so when they did that, everybody's gathered around. There's the image. It's impressive. It's huge. The trumpets blow. The musicians play. And everybody bows down except Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They refused. What did they do? They stand. They stand. In the face of opposition they stand. In the face of the most powerful empire and culture of the, that existed in the world at that time, what did they do? They stand. When there was a threat against their lives, that they would lose their lives, lose their position, lose their influence, if they didn't bow, the, the, the king threatens them. I love the words in Daniel chapter three. These are their words back to the king. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you, for if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power. 
your majesty, but even if he doesn't, I love that phrase, even if he doesn't, even if things don't go my way, even if there's a price to pay, even if it means that I lose my life, even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your God or worship the gold statue that you have set up. Oh, that's some bold stuff, folks. We're not talking about you're gonna get in school suspension if you don't do what we tell you to do. We're talking about Nebuchadnezzar said, if I'm gonna give you one more chance and when they blow the trumpets and everybody bows down, you three, I'm gonna be watching you. You better bow down because if you're still standing, we're gonna take you and we're gonna throw you into a fiery furnace and we're gonna incinerate you. Don't worry about your future. Don't worry about your wealth. Don't worry about your family. Don't worry about your dreams. Don't worry about your social media platform. Don't worry about your bank accounts. Don't worry about your material possession. Don't worry about any of that kind of stuff because you have no future. You have no choice. Bow. In the evil day, in the midst of the battle, how do you stand? Because... Let me just tell you, in your daily life, it's gonna be very rare if the enemy of your soul or the culture around you erects a gold idol in town square and requires you to show up and bow down to it. But don't make the mistake of thinking that there aren't idols in our culture, that you will be required to make a decision about where you're gonna stand or whether you're gonna bow. Make no, uh, power, influence, access, those are idols of American culture. Sex, pleasure, love, those are idols in our culture. Money, commerce, prosperity, material, those are idols in our culture. And the God of this age will erect idols, ideas, philosophies, paradigms, ways of living, and it will be erected before you as a child of God. And if you wait to the day when you're called upon to either bow or stand, you will almost certainly bow to the pressure. But if you've taken the position in private, if you've, if you've gotten some private victories, you'll be able to stand in the middle of public temptations. And they said, we will not bow, no matter what. If, if God saves us, God can save us, but if, even if he doesn't, even if it costs us everything, we will not bow. And you know what happened? <laughs> they didn't bow, and the king kept his word. He cast them into the fiery furnace. Now, you know, that would have been a moment, right? It's like, God, I did the right thing. What's, what's going on? And they stoked it 10 times hotter. And then they threw them in. But it says that when they looked into the fire, they saw the three Hebrew children not consumed, standing in the midst of the fire. And one, like the son of God, was standing there with them in the fire. See, Jesus shows up with you in the midst of the fire. Jesus shows up at your moment, and they were delivered. They came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. And what happened was a divine reversal. They were not consumed in the fire, they were delivered. And once they came out of the fire, because they stood their ground and their convictions, they now had influence in the kingdom. And instead of becoming pariahs, now because God supernaturally revealed himself through their convictions, they were given a place of greater authority and influence because I'm gonna tell you, we live in a world that thinks they want idols and what they really want is an encounter with the living living God and with the living truth. They just need to see somebody that's actually living it and believing it. What about your convictions? Well, how did they get there in order to realize how they got there? Because you don't, again, you don't show up on game day going, I need to practice. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or, or Rakshak and Betty that didn't show up that day and saying, okay, hmm, I haven't been praying I haven't read my Bible in like 10 years and that was at a hotel when they had a Gideon's King James in a drawer. And uh, hmm, okay, so what do we do, guys? What's our conviction on this thing? No, let me show you their conviction. Chapter one, 
of Daniel says that when they had been brought into the king's courts, when they had been taken captive, and the king said, you can eat all the food off of my table that you want, it says in Daniel chapter one, verse nine, and Daniel resolved, listen to this, that he would not defile himself. Wow. With the king's food or with the wine that he drank, and therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And he said, test us. Don't let us eat the king's table. Just give us fruits and vegetables. And then at the end of 10 days, see who's better. And it says that the eunuch had favor, gave them what they wanted. And at the end of 10 days, in verse 14, it says, so the eunuch or the, the, the chief leader listened to them in this matter, and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in the flesh. Come on, somebody. It's biblical to get fat for Jesus. Mm. Next time tells you, somebody tells you you shouldn't eat that, you say, I'm getting fat for Jesus, and I'm following in Daniel's footsteps. Ben and Jerry's is Jesus, is Jesus food. No, they got fat in the flesh, but they got stronger. That's what the word means. Better means stronger. At the end of the 10 days, they were stronger. Why were they stronger? Because they had made a decision that they were not going to defile themselves. How do you position yourself to stand in the battle? You have to make some decisions. You have to make some resolutions. That when it comes... When the battle comes my way, when the enemy comes against me, I'm gonna stand, and I'm gonna stand in not my own strength, but I'm gonna stand in God's strength. I'm gonna put on the full armor of God. I'm gonna think like Jesus thinks, the helmet of salvation. I'm gonna stand in my new identity, which is the breastplate of righteousness. I'm gonna use faith instead of fear to extinguish the fiery temptations and darts of the enemy. I'm gonna live in the center of truth as my belt that holds it all together. Not your truth, not my truth, but the truth. I'm gonna have my feet ready with the gospel of peace because I'm not ashamed of the power of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation. And I'm gonna take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I'm gonna have this so deep inside of my heart that in every situation when I've gotta make a decision, I know the voice of the Holy Spirit and I know what God has already written and what he's already spoken. And I'm going to be able to stand and I've resolved it, I've decided, I've made the decision that I'm not going to fall Pray to the tactics of the enemy that I'm gonna stand. You see, before you can take the position of standing, you've gotta learn the first position. The first position of spiritual warfare is found in James chapter four, verse seven. Submit yourself, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Now, I know that a lot of books have been written about spiritual warfare over the years. Back in the, I don't know, I think it was the 90s, I, somebody gave me a book and it was on defeating principalities and powers. And I thought, well, this will be interesting. And in that book, it, it was talking about because principalities and powers are you know, spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We actually, if we're gonna defeat them, we gotta get into heavenly places to defeat them. So people would like charter planes to fly at 30,000 foot to have prayer meetings to defeat principalities and powers over cities. I don't know what they did before airplanes, but I don't think that, I, th I think that, you know, that's just kinda, that's, ugh. It's just kind of human imagination. It's our own logic and our own... We've made spiritual warfare too complex, too mystical, too sophisticated. We've given the devil far too much credit. And I want to tell you today what true spiritual warfare is. It's found right here. And it starts before you resist the devil, before you have to name the devil, the demon, whatever. You don't have to worry about any of that. The way that you resist or you withstand the enemy is you begin by submitting to God. See, before you can learn this position, you have to learn the most aggressive position in your battle, which is this. I bow my knee to the Lord Jesus. 
I submit, God, to you. In the midst of my battle, I submit. In the midst of my battle, I'm not gonna keep my eyes on the enemy, I'm gonna keep my eyes on Jesus. In the midst of the enemy, when my thoughts are going crazy, when my flesh wants to do what it wants, when the temptation seems to be undeniable, when the voice of the enemy in my ear seems louder than any other voice, my first move is to come under the authority of Jesus. That's what submission means. Submission means to willingly come under the authority of another. You see, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. The Bible says in Colossians that he's disarmed and defeated every foe. When I, in my life, posture myself and say, I'm deciding that I'm not gonna live for myself, but I'm coming under the authority of Jesus. I'm coming under the authority of God's word. I'm submitting every part of me. I'm submitting my identity. I'm submitting my sexuality. I'm submitting my finances. I'm submitting my marriage. I'm submitting my job. I'm submitting my thought life. I'm submitting all the aspects of my life where the battle is coming. I put it under the authority of Jesus, and I say, Jesus, your word is truth. My way will lead me to destruction. Your way leads me to life. You see, this position at the foot of the cross is the most aggressive position that you can take. Learning this position will train you for this position under the authority of God. See, for the enemy to get to you in this position, he has to go through God's position. And how many know that God is stronger than the enemy? See here, let me tell you the mistake that we often make though. We understand and we believe in God's authority, but we set it over there. And we say, no, I got this. I'm gonna take on the enemy, this is my battle. Or you know what, I, I, I don't wanna come under this right now because I kinda like it out here where I'm choosing. This is the demilitarized zone and this is when you're vulnerable. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had long before submitted their lives so that in the day of battle, they were able to stand. God wants you to be able to stand. And in fact, I wanna invite you today to stand to your feet. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Today, I wanna to just ask you, what position are you in today? Are you in position where you've bowed your knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and said, you are Lord. Has every place in your life, Christian, been submitted to the Lord Jesus? Because the victory is yours when the battle is the Lord's. And today, I, I wanna invite, doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what battle you're engaged in, you don't have to figure out the tactics of the enemy. You don't have to know his name. You don't have to have a sophisticated playbook. Your playbook is one move. Bow the knee. Submit. Come under Jesus. Absolute surrender produces absolute victory. Would you bow your heads with me right where you're at? Lord Jesus, today, we submit to you. We say, Lord... We're in battles. Enemy comes in like a flood. But we trust that when he does, you're able to raise up a standard against him. Lord, you are our shield. You are our fortress, our safe place. We hide under the shadow of your wings, under your authority. And Lord, I pray that today, every lie that's blinded us, every ounce of pride that has resisted you, every open door that the enemy has used as a vulnerability 
today, that those doors would be slammed, that our hearts would be softened, our eyes would be opened, and we would bring our whole lives in submission under you. At both campuses, I'm gonna invite our prayer ministry team to make their way to the front and position themselves. And here's how we're gonna close today. Today, if you are here, number one, and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, Normally, I would have people raise their hands, lead them in a prayer, but today I just, I, I sense, I feel like what needs to take place is in a moment when we dismiss when it's not convenient, that if you are here today and you know, I need to repent of my sin, I need to get right with God. When we dismiss in a moment, I'm gonna invite you to stick around and to come forward to one of our prayer team partners at either campus and just say, today, I need to get my life right with God. You need to say it, you need to take a step to do it, you need to leave the old behind and step into the victory that Jesus has. And also today, if you're here and you say, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, but today I, I'm in the middle of a battle that just seems overwhelming. And I need prayer backup. Today, I just need a breakthrough. I need a healing. I need to be free from addiction. I'm tired of losing the battle today, I wanna win. We're just gonna invite you to come and receive prayer as well. And I believe that the victory that Jesus has is a victory that's overwhelming. God, today as we leave this place, I pray that every one of us would have a brand new mindset, a brand new way of seeing, a brand new way of bowing our lives and coming under your authority. Lord Jesus, move in our lives, break off every shackle. Lord, save to the uttermost, heal and deliver. Lord, let the victory of the cross become our victory today. And help us to walk out of this place as salt and light and soldiers of the Lord. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Come on, everybody. Is God good or what? <laughs>